Lord's parables are amongst his most memorable and powerful utterances. They speak of very simple things, things of this world, yet they also speak of things very profound, very deep, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. In the last several years, in our midst, sermons have been preached on some of Christ's parables. The unforgiving servant in Matthew 18. The sower in Matthew 13. In fact, we have two sermons on that. There was too much in it for one sermon. Recently, in connection with the Lord's Supper, we had a sermon on the seating at the feast in Luke 14. Professor Henkel was preached here on the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. But there are many more parables and great riches to be gathered from them. Some reckon that there are as many as 27 parables recorded for us in the Gospel accounts. And I say some reckon 27 because there is a question of clarification. Some say this is a parable, and others say, well, it's not really a parable, it's only like a parable. So, about 27. Now, if we were to consider all of those, that, I think, I think you would probably agree with me, would be too lengthy a series. So I'm intending to deal with a much more manageable number of them. And more specifically, the parables which Christ <coughs> preached during the last week before his crucifixion. When he died for our sins. And there are seven of them. And the Lord, knowing that he was soon to depart, gave parables which especially focus on his return. And our being ready. And we'll see that as we go through them one by one. Some more, some less. But that's the general thrust of them. And now this morning we turn to the first. These seven parables of Christ's last week. Before he was put on the cross for our sins. Consider then the laborers in the vineyard. The laborers in the vineyard. The various interpretations and the Lord's teaching. The laborers in the vineyard, the various interpretations and the Lord's teaching. First of all, I'd like us to have the layout of our text clearly before us. This, if you will, is a sort of overview. The broad layout and then once we've that in place we'll descend to details later. So if you please look with me at your Bibles. The first thing we have is the hiring of the laborers to work in the landowner's vineyard in verses 1 through 7. You see that? The hiring of the laborers. Then in verses 8 and following we have the pay of the laborers. Some of those who are paid murmur about the wages, verses 10 through 12. To them, the landowner responds in verses 13 through 15. The parable closes with this moral or lesson, this point, verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few are chosen. That's the broad overview. The hiring of the laborers, verses 1 through 7, and then the paying of the laborers, verses 8 and following, which generates the grumbling of some of the laborers, to which the Lord of the vineyard replies. And then finally we have the word about the first being last, the last being first, and many being called, but few chosen. Now with that general layout, of our text before us, we're going to descend to greater detail and summarize the story. Imagine, if you will, a land owner. 
He needs workers for his vineyard. He knows that the labor pool is to be found in the marketplace. And so he makes several trips to recruit workers. And the workers which he hires essentially fall into two categories. First we have those who are hired at the very start of the day. Six o'clock in the morning. They're hired for a full 12 hour day. With the day ending at 6 p.m. That's a long day. And these folk agree wages with the employer for a penny for their day's work. A penny, don't think our terms, but a penny was a denarius. This was the standard daily wage for a laborer or a soldier. One denarius, one penny for a day's work. That's the first group. Then there is the second group of laborers. And they are hired, hired after the first group. Some at the third hour of the day, which would be nine o'clock in the morning. Some at the sixth hour, which would be noon. Some at the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Some at the eleventh hour, 5 p.m. Now, although there were four recruitments here, essentially they're a group hired after the first group. That's the first distinctive thing about them, after the first group. And the second thing about them, in contrast to the first group, is that no specific pay is agreed upon between them and the master or landowner. Verse 4 and verse 7 the landowner says, whatsoever is right, I will give you. And it's left at that. But no specific pay is agreed upon. So then, 6 p.m. arrives. The working day is over, and it is time to pay the laborers. First to be paid are those who were hired at the 11th hour. And they now receive one penny, one denarius, a whole day's labor for one hour's work. And you can imagine how delighted they must have been. This was a good day for them. You only have to work one hour for a full day's wages. Then the focus turns, and we skip the people who were hired at the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour. The focus turns upon those who labored for the whole day, the 12 hours. And their eyes must have widened too at the extravagant payment given to those who were hired at the 11th hour. We are going to get proportionally more. Maybe, maybe if one hour gets one denarius, our 12 hours will gain us 12 denariuses, or denarii. For one day's work, then I get paid for 12 days' work. They're eager. But, they are too, are given one penny, the one denarius, on which they had agreed with the landowner. This is where the murmuring starts. These last, verse 12 says, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. Or if you want to put it in one short phrase, that's not fair. <laughs> 